I, I feel sorry for everyone that has to look at me on a big screen, but I guess that's unavoidable uh, as a problem. Uh, so I want to start with a little uh, joke that's going to encapsulate the entire talk. So if someone wants to go out for an ice cream or something after this joke, you would get the whole talk. So here it is. So uh, a guy believes he's obsessed with sex and it's ruining his life. So he goes to a psychiatrist and he tells her this problem and she says, here, I'll test you and, and we can find out. And so she shows him three pictures. And the first picture is a picture of a cow. And she's like, what do you see? And he goes, I see a couple having sex. And she's like, okay, notes that. Shows him a second picture of the Empire State Building. And he, she's like, what do you see? And he says, I see a couple having sex again. And then she shows him another picture of a, a cake. And she says, what do you see? He says, I see a couple having sex again. And she goes, it is, it's true. You were right. You're, you're obsessed with sex and it's problematic. And he says, what are you talking about? You're the one showing me all the smutty pictures. So uh, I can't hear everyone laughing. I, I hope that everyone is laughing. So that's that's going to be sort of my take on on uh, the theory of biopower. So I, I want to go back and talk a little bit about Leibniz. So uh, before I get into that, so I think there are events in history. There aren't many of them, but there are some that invalidate philosophies that come before them. And I think this is what famously occurs with the Great Lisbon Earthquake of 1755. So in addition to destroying the city of Lisbon, the earthquake, I think, more or less puts together puts to rest Leibniz's theodicy. That's the attempt to reconcile evil with the existence of God. And, and despite the discredit that surrounds it, I think Leibniz's work, the theodicy, is actually a pretty impressive philosophical work that tries to explain the existence of both moral and natural evils while reconciling that with the goodness of God. And as Leibniz sees it, because of the interrelations of all things, we can't have a perfect world. Even, even God has to create, has to allow for some evil, or every good has to require some evil. So for Leibniz, God did the best he could, and we should regard everything that happens in this light. No matter how horrific the events that happen in the world, it's nonetheless, the, for Leibniz, the best of all possible worlds. So Leibniz dies decades before, of course, the great Lisbon earthquake, He's not around to witness this historical refutation of his doctrine, but the destructiveness of this natural disaster makes it impossible, I think, for Leibniz's followers to continue to believe that we live in the best of all possible worlds. What's more, the event also allows Voltaire an occasion to satirize Leibniz in his philosophical novel Candide, which, in which the earthquake is actually the least of all possible least of all evils that that begets that besets Pangloss, which is uh, uh, Voltaire's stand-in for for Leibniz. So Voltaire's send-up of Leibniz and his philosophy end up becoming much more well-known than Leibniz's philosophy itself, which comes to seem in the decades and centuries that follow a kind of self-parody. So the earthquake puts an end to the viability of Leibniz's theological argument, and then Voltaire nails the coffin shut. And I think such events are extremely rare in human history. Usually philosophies are, are viable long past the death of the, of the writer and past any kind of historical event. But I think today, actually, I want to contend we're living through another such event. And my argument is that the COVID-19 pandemic and specifically Giorgio Agamben's response to it actually reveals the unviability of the theory of biopower. So this theory which sees dominance being exercised through the production of bare life is in its heyday, or at least it was, as, as Jed's talk kind of showed, prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, and now there are modifications of it. But according to this theory, power invades our lives by, our lives by creating a preoccupation with survival above all else. And in the epoch of biopower's reign, survival and health become the only values, and they take up the center of our political world and displace politics itself, which is especially a problem for Agamben. He's following Arendt, I think, in this line of thinking. This emphasis on survival marks the death of actual political struggle as the contention over a form of life devolves into an imperative to survive above all else. According to this theory, a radical transformation of the political field from threatening death to enforcing life comes to define this new epoch of power. And the transformation brings about the evanescence of political contestation.
everything becomes a question of health rather than a question of political action. So the response of authorities and theorists of biopower to the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, indicates that the explanatory power of this theory, like Leibniz's theodicy in the face of the Lisbon earthquake, cannot survive our contemporary disaster. The attempt to save lives, or what Agamben would say, to, to make live, what Foucault would also say, uh, cuts against, I think, the economic imperatives of capital and thus against the basic way that the ruling socioeconomic system functions today. Working on behalf of survival becomes evident as a political response, not just an indication of the abeyance of politics proper as it is for the theories, the theorists of biopower. It is a response that calls for universal solidarity against the destruction of the virus, a solidarity that thwarts the prevailing logic of the commodity form. The efforts to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 actually put a wrench in the accumulation of capital. As a result, I think, as much as any of the human victims of this disaster, the theory of biopower succumbs to its ravages. The natural disaster, such as a pandemic, has the effect of exposing the problem of survival as a political question. And I think that's one of the things, I think that's true of any natural disaster. I think it's become especially apparent in the, in the pandemic. So the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, gives the lie to the theory of biopower because the prevailing responses to the pandemic reveal the tension between survival and the exigencies of the ruling socioeconomic system. The attempt to preserve life which would seem to be the primary operation of contemporary power, actually interrupts and disrupts the functioning of capitalism. It's not just an imposition of enforced survival on a reluctant but pliable populace. It's instead the expression of a politicized solidarity. And I think that's why it occasions so much political response on the other side. This is especially, I think, the case with the COVID-19 pandemic, although I think it's true in any natural disaster. And this, what's important, I think, is this pandemic affects disproportionately the elderly and those physically vulnerable, not the young and the healthy. Thus, the response requires a sacrifice on the part of those who are not endangered on behalf of those who are. And that's why I think a lot of people are reluctant to make that sacrifice. Instead of aiding in the process of capital's accumulation, the measures designed to address the pandemic operate as a break on the capitalist system. Even when they're even even in the term when they're put, couched in terms of aiding capital, I think they're still in some way functioning as a kind of a break. So at the moment when it imposes restrictions on economy and on the project on the project of accumulation, state power ceases to work hand in hand with the forces of capital, which it's often trying to do. So power exposes itself at these moments as fundamentally divided rather than singular and testifies, I think, to the vitality of the field of political contestation. Thus, the pandemic and the response to it show that the theory of biopower actually marks a fundamental theoretical misstep, a misstep that's had, in my view, baleful political consequences because it distracts us from the primacy of capital within the social order and puts the focus onto power, which I think is kind of amorphous. So the attempt to preserve life during the COVID-19 pandemic leads to a series of measures that interrupt the flow of, of capital. So social distancing, lockdowns, mask mandates. The leaders of capitalist states institute these measures in the name of allowing citizens to continue to live, but they recognize that such measures have a deleterious effect on the economy, which is why they occasion so much resistance, especially from right-wing proponents of unbridled liberal capitalism. These are not simply expressions of domination, I don't think, but moves that run afoul of the controlling socioeconomic structure. So leaders employ them reluctantly because they have no interest in damaging the capitalist economy that runs their societies. But I think the exigencies of people's survival and the solidarity that that survival requires depend upon these state interventions. In this way, the conflict between the exercise of state power and the capitalist economy comes to a head in the response to COVID-19 and the whole pandemic problem. In the midst of this response, it becomes clear, I think, that there's no pure exercise of biopower because there's no single site of authority. 
the divide between state and capital comes to a head when disaster strikes, which is what I think the theory of biopower fails to account for because it doesn't fully take the power of the capitalist economy into account. The natural disaster reveals that survival requires political solidarity and runs counter to capitalism's imperative to accumulate as an isolated monad. So rather than confronting this discrepancy between the state and capital, Giorgio Agamben proclaims that capital simply capitulates before the power of the biosecurity regime that now controls the state. So for Agamben, it's this regime, not capital, that actually holds the cards today. In, and in this little collection, it's a collection of articles that he wrote, he added a few things, but of articles that he wrote uh, in response to the pandemic called, Where Are We Now? He writes, capitalism for its part has only with a few exceptions accepted losses to productivity that it would never previously have considered, probably hoping that later on it can find an accord with the new religion of medicine. I just found that a striking kind of claim that it's actually the religion of medicine that's dominant today in capitals trying to trying to fit itself to that. I, I find that funny, I guess. Uh, so as Agamben frames it here, capitalism is not the strongest force in contemporary society. The pandemic shows how it bows before the demands of what he calls the religion of freedom. But this position, I think, radically underestimates the dominance that capital typically has over the state. So I don't think it's a secondary force in our lives. Rather, it is the primary one. And the provenance of the resistance against the re measures instituted to protect against the pandemic, I think, indicates their political bearing, that the re these resistance movements are not emancipatory efforts struggling against the ruling order. They're not fights against an oppressive power structure. Instead, the resistance against measures used to fight the pandemic stem from those who champion the free flow of capital, from business owners and libertarians to Donald Trump and Jair Bolsonaro. So confronted with being on the side of Trump and Bolsonaro, Agamben claims that we live in political confu politically confused times where right and left lose their straightforward significance. And this is again in this collection, he claims, a truth remains such whether, is it whether it is expressed by the left or enunciated by the right. While this seems like a just a neutral statement about the nature of truth, it's actually, I think, an indication of Agamben's radical turn to the right. So the leftist understanding of truth, as I take it, necessarily includes the site of enunciation as integral to the truth being articulated. For instance, just to take a simple example, it's a far different matter when Donald Trump denounces the exploitative practices of Jeff Bezos and a union leader does so. Those are just two different things. Trump says this as, a, as to damage a competitor, even a political competitor. Uh, while well, the union leader says it as part of a collective struggle against the forces of big capital. So Trump uses the truth to lie because the desire, because of the desire driving the statement, whereas this is obviously not the case with the union leader. The desire that informs the statement of truth or why one is saying it is always a part of what one says. And I think to fail this, to take this into account as Agamben doesn't do, is to play into the hands of the right, which much, must always ignore uh, the logic of desire, I think. And the fact that Agamben finds himself on the same side as Trump and Bolsonaro in response to the pandemic, I think, points to the error of bio, bio, the theory of biopower's conception of politics. For these theorists, the struggle is always a struggle against power, which is typically manifested in the state. With the pandemic, however, a split opens up between the forces of the state and the forces of capital. And the site of power itself becomes radically and clearly divided. This is a divide between, this is a divide, I'm sorry, that the theorists of biopower have difficulty reckoning with, which is why, aside from a brief comment about capitalism's capitulation to the forces of biosecurity, Agamben main, remains more or less silent about capitalism during the pandemic. So the turn from economy to power leaves the theorists of biopower, I think, especially ill-equipped to analyze the structures of the capitalist social order. Capitalism doesn't rule through the deployment of power, but through inserting itself into subject's desire, which is a term that Michel Foucault, for one, explicitly rejects. So by focusing on power, Foucault misses what drives subjects to commit themselves to capitalist society. It's not the power 
that capitalism has over them, but the way that it entices and structures their desire. So capitalism doesn't issue threats or commands, but rather entices with the promise of unlimited satisfaction that the, co the commodity will provide. One invests oneself in capitalism for the promise of a future satisfaction that will never come, and the impossibility of the future that capitalism holds out uh, before us doesn't detract from its appeal, but actually augments it. We strive for what we cannot attain and never cease striving because we fail. The, every time we fail, it fuels our desire even more. While the capitalist economy occasionally imposes its power on people, of course, this is entirely a secondary operation. It rules through the logic of desire, not the discourse of power. And as long as Foucault and Agamben analyze the workings of power, I contend they will miss what keeps capitalism going, including the relationship that develops between capitalism and the state. What Foucault and his inheritors have in common with Marxism is the belief that the state is always an oppressive force. So Foucault and other biopower theorists don't often mention capitalism because they don't see it as fundamentally distinct from the power of the state. In contrast to Marx, these figures don't see the state as simply the expression of capital's self-interest. Instead, both are expressions of power and power is the problem. And the inability to theorize capitalist, capitalist, capital's dominance in, ep in an epoch when it manifests itself everywhere, I think is a primary weakness of this theory. While Agamben worries a great deal about the expansion of state power, he's relatively silent about the role that the, cap that the logic of capital plays in people's subjection. There's no sense that capitalism, rather than state power, represents the fundamental threat confronting humanity today. I would argue that it does. Uh, there's no insistence that the project of emancipation must first and foremost take on the forces of capital in order to confront this threat. In fact, Agamben's interventions during the COVID-19 disaster bespeak his absolute resistance to any expression of state power, if it, even if it might act as a break on capitalist expansion. As he sees it, any exercise of power by the state in the name of preserving life has the effect of reducing persons to the status of bare life, of extending the regime of biosecurity through the announcement of a state of exception. So authorities that take advantage of any occasion, something like a pandemic, to increase their con the control over life, and this becomes the only real danger. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, the distance between capital and the state, as I contend, blows wide open. In order to respond to the crisis, states around the world resort to measures that stop the flow of capital and restrict the functioning of capital society. The, state, uh, the state's attempt to, to ensure the survival of its citizens takes on a kind of anti, or it seems to me, a clearly anti-capitalist Hugh, so states make emergency payments to all citizens, freeze evictions, expand free medical care, offer state-funded child care, and close businesses. These are not actions that are beneficial to capital. And if this is a state of exception, maybe we should try to make it permanent. So at this point, I think the power of the state and the interests of capital come into opposition. The theorists of biopower have no way, I don't think, to account for this division, which is why Agamben's response to the pandemic has been so woeful. Unable to recognize the potential radicality of the split between state power and the forces of capital, Agamben lumps both together under the rubric of biopower and launches a series of diatribes against its expansion during the pandemic. When he does this, when he does discuss the difference, he laments capitalism's capitulation to the state and to the regime of biopower. And these diatribes, I think, show the failure of the theory of biopower to think through the politics of capitalist society in crisis. But more than this, I think Agamben's reactions to the pandemic highlight fundamental missteps that have always been present but never fully apparent. The pandemic reveals that the theory of biopower is not really a theory of emancipation after all, but a theory that ends up supporting the workings of capital. At various points, Agamben rails against social distancing, lockdowns, and even mask mandates. All of the means that the states have used to that state the state has used to fight against the explosion of the pandemic receive his scorn, and none receive his endorsement. So if Agamben had his way, the vulnerable would be left to die, but at least they could die outside of the regime of biopower. As he sees it, the responses represent the choice of preserving bare life over sustaining a form of life, which renders them complicit with the contemporary dominance of biopower.
Opting for survival over a viable form of life leaves us with a world in which no one can live. This is how he would see it. So as Agamben puts it in one of these letters or one of these uh, brief uh, essays, bare life and the danger of losing it is not something that unites people, but blinds and separates them. Other human beings are now seen solely as possible spreaders of the plague whom one, one must avoid at all costs and from whom one needs to keep oneself at a distance of at least a meter. Agamben attacks the attacks the distancing used to stop the spread of the disease. As he sees it, social distancing is actually the worst type of oxymoron. So distance entails for Agamben the annihilation of sociality. So social and distance actually have nothing to do with each other. But I think this actually is right at the heart of the problem of Agamben's critique of the pandemic and the theory of biopower. So there's a kind of blindness, as I see it, within this theory to the way the role that mediation plays within social relations, a mediation that has to work through distance. So by keeping a distance from each other, we don't act antisocially. Instead, I think we uphold the social bond insofar as we utilize forms of mediation. Sociality occurs when I exchange letters, have a conversation, or engage in a discussion. All of these forms of sociality rely on the mediation of language which connects us to each other by separating us. The mediation of language provides the basis for the social bond, but it does so at the cost of actual proximity. So when I relate to the other through words, these words enact a barrier between us, but the barrier is actually an enabling one. And this mediation creates the bond through distance, and this enables the bond to, sep to exist through the separation of subjects from each other. So social distance actually makes sociability possible, I want to contend, through the creation of an interstitial space that mediates between various subjects. Or I can interact with the other because the mediation of a public world gives me breathing space where the other is not overpresent. In contrast to, say, familial relations that involve over proximity, the social bond holds us together through social distance. Far from being an oxymoron, then, social distance actually represents the only possible form of sociality. The move from proximity to distance is the move from a closed connection of the family to the open bond of society. But instead of recognizing that distance is the sine qua non of sociality, Agamben ties our social being to proximity, which is why he recoils so uh, harshly from this term social distance. So I think we need to ex have the courage to accept that disasters are simply disasters, that they don't hold a secret upside that renders their occurrence more palatable. But I also think we need the courage to recognize that survival isn't always ideological. And when the state has to resort to extraordinary interruptions of the capitalist economy to keep us alive, it's not necessarily acting as the stooge of biopower. Instead, it's showing us the limit to capital's dominance over our existence and exposing how our survival has to be a collective survival, not an individual one. The only real survival, I think, is, solid, is survival through solidarity. And we can see in the disaster this the, po the, po the possibility of this conception of survival through solidarity. The disaster makes evident a rift in the structure of power. And the only way, I want to say, to avow the truth of the COVID-19 event is to acknowledge the solidarity that makes it evident. 